This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Ted Arnold. I'm here with the, the Cornell store. And uh, months back, long before we really had any idea of what this book contained, except for Professor Ferret, of course, um, I invited him, you know, seeing that he was a, a new faculty member, uh, to come and, and chat about his book. And I had the opportunity to um, browse through a couple of the chapters. And there's no question this should be a very interesting discussion today. Um, please do get a look at the book. It's, it's really fun. Um, he's a brave man for putting all this out there. Um, the introduction, really a couple of pages into, it's got you hooked. And you won't want to put it down. Um, and really, I'll, I'll leave it to, to Grant to go ahead and take it. Um, we are we are getting this tape for Cornell Cast, so um, we'll we'll try to keep it to around the three o'clock limit. Um, I can tell from the book that he could really give an entire weekend seminar on this topic, um, but we will keep it to three o'clock, um, and then we'll have cupcakes and various goodies over here when we're finished. So, without further ado, it's my honor to introduce Professor Grant Farad of the English and Africana departments. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. I, it's it's a pathology, so <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's kind of a crazy book. Um, so I'm going to read from it, and you can tell me how crazy I am at the end. But I'd like to thank everybody for coming, my colleagues, my students, and the man whose job I really want, Brian Scales. But we, <laughs> that's another matter entirely. I could coach rather than teach. I'm your man, coach. Um, Anyway, so I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction and then the title chapter, which is um, um, Long Distance Love. So I remember dates, birthdays, anniversaries, important historical events. Today, for example, um, it's the day Virginia Woolf committed suicide. I think it's there also um, two. Robert Banks has a birthday today, and there's one other famous writer who I'm forgetting. But anyway. I never forget dates. In my life, there are few dates more important than the 18th of March, 2004. It was the day I met God. I'll give the talk, I said, as long as you get John Barnes to come to it. They offered instead to get me tickets to the Liverpool Wolves game. Sorry, I replied. I would eventually revise that position, but not until later. Two nights before I was due to give the talk at Liverpool John Moores University, JMU, just as just after having given a talk at the University of Manchester, at the invitation, as fate would have it, of a Manchester United fan, I was in a noisy student pub outside the University of Manchester when someone handed me a cell phone. John Barnes is coming to your talk, the voice on the other end of the line said. John Barnes. In truth, I still didn't believe it. The player who had enabled me to be finally, truly a Liverpool fan was coming to hear me give a talk. I was going to meet John Barnes, Liverpool winger, Liverpool captain, scorer of one of the greatest goals in the history of football. He scored that goal on the 10th of June, 1984, at the Maracanã Stadium in Rio, England against the Brazilians. Barnes beat five Brazilian defenders, left them sprawling in his wake, mesmerized them, made Brazilians believe that the traditionally stolid English, after all, might have some skill in addition to that famed toughness and endurance. Pele, it was said, admired the goal. John Barnes is a player I had worshipped for almost 15 years. I would watched him play for Liverpool on TV in Cape Town, South Africa in the, late, in the late 1980s with so many dearly held memories of that phenomenal 1987-1988 season. They went 29 games before they lost. I would watched him play in a dingy TV, on TV in a dingy community hall in Detroit where I'd experienced the pain of the 1996 FA Cup loss to Eric Cantona, a goal by Cantona at the death. I'd watched him countless times in crowded Irish bars on the east side of Manhattan, TV scattered everywhere in the, in the mid and late 1990s, first as a graduate student and then as an English professor who traveled three hours to watch a Liverpool game. I'd watched him on TV in my various homes in the USA, from New York City to a small college town in New England, every opportunity I got. John Barnes was coming to my talk. It was the culmination of a strange and not so, and yet not so strange sequence of events. 
I'd written an essay, the foundation of this book, entitled Long Distance Love. Somebody read it, they gave it to somebody else, and this guy, a friend of mine, Ross Dawson, who's an Englishman, who got a, deg a little puddly and who got a degree um, at the University of Indiana. He didn't believe people in English departments, particularly not people in English departments in the U.S., wrote books about Liverpool. So Ross invited me to give this talk. Five minutes before the John Moore's um, talk, I was busy putting my papers in order, and someone, a student of Ross's, I think, said, John Barnes is coming. I thought they were taking the mickey out of me. Who wouldn't have made fun of me? Then, there he was, in the flesh, smiling, confident, and friendly. I moved a couple of steps towards John Barnes. It's an honor to meet God, I said. He smiled. I'm sure he thought I was mad. Um, he kept smiling benignly, and sensing that I was overwhelmed, he went on. I'm going to give you a few minutes to compose yourself before your talk. We'll chat later. I remember everything about that talk. Um, after the talk, I, I said tentatively, you want to join us for drinks? He said, sure, without hesitation. Drinks drifted into dinner, five hours in total. Between drinks and dinner, Barnes and I were strolling, a little behind everyone else, on our way from the bar to the restaurant. When he got a call on his cell phone, or mobile, as he called it, Jamie, he said, before launching into a brief conversation, see you Saturday at Old Trafford. Tottenham Hotspur, Spurs were playing Manchester United at Old Trafford, the latter's home ground that weekend, and Jamie Redknapp was then playing for Spurs. Barnes hung up his mobile. He talked about Jamie's knee injury, how much Jamie liked playing for Spurs, what a good pass of the ball his friend was. Jamie Redknapp was, like Barnes himself, a former Liverpool captain. Redknapp had been on the end of an, end of, other end of a conversation to which I'd been, completely by chance, privy. It was an entirely surreal moment in my life. Here I was with God, who was talking on his cell phone to another former Liverpool captain and an England international midfielder, a player much beloved by the Anfield, and Anfield's the Liverpool home ground, by the Anfield faithful and his teammates for his inch-perfect passing. All of them, from Barnes to Robbie Fowler to Stevie Gerrard, comment on it. I didn't even dream about something like this happening to me. Maybe this is re the reward for a lifelong pathology, a pathology whose proper name is love. Here I was, as Barnes might say, or Diego Maradona, here I was, touched by the hand of God. Okay, so if you, thought that was bad, if you think that was bad, I have more craziness for you. Um, this is the opening chapter, Long Distance Love, and I'll, I'll just fess up right away. I am a Liverpool fundamentalist. <laughs> I believe in God, John Barnes, and God's own son, Stephen George Gerrard. I believe in the Holy Trinity of managers, Bob Paisley, Bill Shankly, and Kenny Dalgleish. I believe in the communion of saints, Graham Souness, Michael Owen, Ian St. John. How much more saintly than that can you get anyway? Ian Callahan, Ray Kennedy, Steve McMahon, Alan Hansen, Mark Lawrenson, Terry McDermott, Ian Rush, Jan Mulby, Alan Kennedy, both Fulds, Neil and Thompson, John Ulrich, Peter Beardsley, Steve McManaman, Jamie Carragher, on and on. In my perfect world, I would abandon my job as an academic to walk the sidelines at Anfield Road on Merseyside, home of my beloved Liverpool Football Club. I would give up my status as tenured professor an appointment I have spent years acquiring, turn my back on teaching, and forgo the pleasures of research, all so that I could manage Liverpool. I would abandon all this just so I could be in charge of Liverpool's fortunes every Saturday afternoon to see them outplay Manchester United, dominate Arsenal, and put perennially struggling English premiership clubs, variously this season Southampton's, next West Ham or Charlton, to put them to the sword. Like other fanatical supporters of the Reds, I dream of coaching Liverpool to glory, to multiple triumphs in Europe, to Premier League championship after championship. However, managing the pool is, as every true fan will tell you, a second-hand fantasy, or, at the very least, a substitute fantasy, the second dream. It is a dream that replaced the original one, the dream transformed because the first one could no longer be deferred. The original dream's passing has had to be quietly or sometimes not so quietly acknowledged. Management as a fantasy is a poor replacement for the real thing, the dream of playing for your favorite team. Managing is a mark 
of resignation. Those who can't do, like me, who can't play, they coach. And I, I all due apologies, because <laughs> I know your pain. It's, it's mine. I'm completely on your side. But your job is still better than mine. <laughs> Classic Freudian displacement, except we fans would never call it that. Such a confrontation with the truth of our athletic limitation would be too much, too painful to bear. Between 1977 and 1989, my dreams were simply phrased grandiose. I wanted to play for Liverpool, to be the club's central midfielder. My deepest longing was to wear that number seven shirt. In the Liverpool system of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the central midfielder, my position on my local team, wore number 11. Seven was the, was the number assigned to the creative forward, whereas the truly, purely goal-scoring striker, such as Ian Rush and Robbie Fowler, owned number nine. But seven is my favorite number, and it was also the number worn by the most flamboyant Liverpool players of my childhood years. Seven, the number on the shirts of Kevin Keegan and Kenny Dalglish, the iconic Liverpool players of my youth. I would cringe years later to see such unworthies as Vladimir Schmitzer and Harry Kiel put that number seven shirt on their backs. What must Keegan and Dalglish have been thinking? Apostasy? My obsession with Keegan's shirt demonstrates nothing so much as the extent to which fandom, especially of the more pathological variety, is a complex mixture of an overreaching athletic pursuit, wanting to be like my Liverpool heroes, and personal foible, excessive attachment to a particular number. I have no doubt that I share my unfulfillable fantasies with many a young Liverpool, with many a Liverpool FC fan, a community whose ranks I joined as a young boy in 1970. Um, my fidelity, well, I'm going to go on. Let me just read a little bit, of, and then I'll go on to complete craziness. Um, so my love affair with central midfielders began in the 1980s, really, with Graham Souness and Stephen McMahon. My fidelity to central midfielders has, needless to say, survived the death of my first romance with Graham Souness. And Graham Souness is truly a pitiable human being. Um, he, he's really, really, completely uncompromising. But he has nary a person in the world who would call Graham friend. But what can I say? He's my boy. Um, anyway, so it has survived the death of my first romance. And today, the Liverpool native Steven Gerrard is the play I watch most intently. Stevie G, as I and, other, and countless others have named him, is the player I most keep an eye on as I watch the Premier League on satellite or digital cable from the United States. In other moments, I call him Heighton Skelly, in honor of that part of Liverpool he's from. Heighton and Skelly is a shorthand term for Scousers. If you're from Liverpool, you don't really speak English, but you pretend to in the languages they call Scousers. And I'll tell you a quick joke, um, so talking about my obsession with dates, but Brian Clough died eight days ago. And Brian Clough was this iconic socialist manager of Nottingham Forest. There's a wonderful book out on him called The Damned United. So if you really want to sort of see that there's more than one person like me in the world, you should read this book. Um, but Brian Clough wrote his autobiography, and, and Liverpool and Notts Forest went at it a lot in the 1970s um, and 80s. And Cloughy writes his autobiography, and it's terrible. He condemns all the Liverpool fans so people asked him, you know, Mr. Clough, you know, what do you think about Liverpool fans reading your book? And he said, firstly, half of them can't read. <laughs> and the other half, well, they're too busy. They're out stealing hubcaps. Um, but if you've ever been to Liverpool, it's a truly gray grim, it's a godforsaken city. Um, the wind whips off the mercy. You can see why the Beatles cleared the hell out of there as soon as they could. Um, but everybody wears shiny tracksuits. White shell, they call shell suits. They're abominable taste, but, and, and they're called skellies because they go around Europe stealing what they call trainers. In the 1980s, Liverpool, were, they were really famous for this. You know, we dominated Europe. So people would go to Italy, and these Gucci's and Armani's would be like, shoes would be on the streets of Liverpool. People who didn't have jobs. But anyway, um, so this is me and Stevie G, and Stevie's a native Scouser. Um, I marvel at Gerard this reincarnation of the 1980s maestro, Souness. Gerard is uncompromising in the tackle, arguably more visionary in his passing and more subtle in his skill than his Scottish predecessor, Souness is Scottish. 
As his goal scoring exploits of the 2000-2001 campaign suggest, he's a markedly better finisher than his goal scorer, and he certainly has more of an eye for the key match-changing goal. Um, I'm sure Jim and the football folks over here know, um, Olympiacos, AC Milan, Cardiff. Um, then the legendary Edinburgh hardman, Graham Souness. Now at the height of his powers, Gerard has scored 22 goals in European competition for Liverpool, tied with Michael Owen ahead of Ian Rush as the club's leading marksman in, the European, in European competition. With some 80 goals in all competitions for the club, he is likely to score well over 100 by the time he calls it quits on his Anfield career. I love Gerard's ability to hit long, long, raking, defense-splitting passes and to defend with sureness and conviction. Liverpool has built its side around him since early this century. England coaches Sven Goran Eriksson and Steve McLaren lack the footballing intelligence to emphatically do so, and their results attest to the consequences. I would venture that had the former Liverpool great Kevin Keegan, himself a miserable failure as a manager, been in charge, England would now be Stevie's team. Still only in his mid-20s, actually he'll be 28 in about two months less three days. Um, you get the point, right? Um, Gerard is already great. I loved it when he wore number 17. You have to admit it's a fair blend of 7 and 11. He has since changed his number to 8, a shirt once worn by John Ulrich. I preferred 17, no disrespect to the Irish scouser John Ulrich. Okay, um, so this is about dreams. My Liverpool dream, however, and this is less pathological, I promise, um, is not so much a distinguished real one as a relationship with a Merseyside club marked by a series of differences. Of course, sadly, my dreams will not come true. Not dreams number one, or not dream number one, or dream number two. What is distinct about my fantasy is not even the geographical origin of this love affair, apartheid South Africa, though that in and of itself has cultural and political significance. The salience of my dream is rather that most of my Liverpool recollections, all my memories, my entire narrative about this English football club were born and nourished without the benefit of ever having seen my team play. And trust me, by now, you know that this is a deeply proprietary relationship. Liverpool is my club, mine. The players, they come and go, as T.S. Eliot said, like Michelangelo, yes? It is only fans like me who remain constant. Liverpool belongs to me and fans like me. Not until May 1977, that's the first time I saw them play, in a televised match, the FA Cup final against Manchester United at the old Wembley Stadium. It was my 1970s hero, Keegan's second-to-last game, a match Liverpool lost on a wintry Cape Town afternoon that still leaves a bitter taste in my mouth. The score was 2-1, and I can still recall to this day the Lou Macari goal that beat us. The pain of that defeat, as all sp sports fans know, can last, maybe I should just say last, a lifetime. It was a cruel introduction to watching God's own team play. It was supposed to be the highlight of my season, if not quite the highlight of my young life. Uh, sorry, yeah. I had looked forward to that match for weeks before. I had bought my first Liverpool poster from a local newsagent and pinned it on the wall above my bed. I barely remember the score in the junior game I played that morning. After that game in our council house, crowded with family and guests, I was too stunned to speak, too hurt to do, it, too hurt to do anything but head for the privacy of the room I shared with my sister. Okay, so. Sorry. Okay, this is promise, the last section, and it's, a, it's kind of a tribute to Kevin Keegan and Suness, and then the final part is about Barnes, which is, I promise you, slightly complicated. It was after I first became a fan in February 1970 that the irrepressible Englishman Kevin Keegan, and then seven years later, again, that magical number seven, the massively talented Scotsman Kenny Dalgleish pulled on the number seven jersey every Saturday for the Reds. Liverpool teams from the early 1970s to the mid-1980s turned on the performance of the player wearing number seven. First it was Keegan, a moderately skilled player from lowly Scunthorpe who was transformed by his experience at Anfield. In a remarkable career, Kevin Keegan went from the English fourth division, the equivalent of single A ball, baseball in the US, to Liverpool, from where he proceeded to become the outstanding English player 
of his generation. He captained England, but never Liverpool, and later managed Newcastle United. He's in charge there again, Fulham, and Manchester City, before assuming with little success the job as England's coach in 1999. He did, however, as England manager, hand his debut to one Steven Gerrard. Nice one, Keegs. Keegan's managerial stint at Newcastle was an amazing moment in the, Hingley, in the history of the English Northeast. He had the Geordies, that is Newcastle, playing a scintillating brand of attacking football. They had nary a defender worthy of the name, but they moved forward with a relentlessness, a verve, and an appetite for goals that won you over. Every game, it seemed, that Newcastle played ended up with a 4-3 scoreline. In one memorable game, Keegan's Magpies, yes, Newcastle has quite a few nicknames, thrashed Manchester United 5-0. It was a humiliation that left the Liverpool fan feeling just a little smug. Keegan arrived at Liverpool believing himself to be only an ordinary player, which motivated him to train hard and play even harder, in the course of which he acquired a charming flamboyance. Keegan was, after the 1960s as wayward Northern Irishman George Best, the first genuine British football star. A muscular 5'7", he sported an unruly, expensively coiffed afro, which matched his appetite for brash outfits. Articulate in his exchanges with the media, he had a great love for goals, of both the spectacular and the mundane variety, and he seemed to take an immense pleasure in his on-field accomplishments. Keegan defined 1970s British sporting hipness, combining mud with soul in his self-representation, tight-fitting jackets, wide lapel floral shirts, and check trousers that were topped by that famous manicured, cur manicured curly afro. He was nevertheless marked by the peculiar discipline of his Liverpool managers, both Shankly and Bob Paisley. A Liverpool legend, an entrance to Shankly Gates is named in his honor, and if you want to know the depth of my family's pathology, my brother named his first son, I kid you not, Shankly. <laughs> We had to stop short because the second kid would have had all <laughs> kinds of other names. I'll tell you another. My sister, who's truly a terrible human being, um, because she grew up with these brothers who were totally you know, Liverpool fans, so she supports every team that plays <laughs> against us. But my nephew, her son, made the mistake of coming home with a Manchester United shirt. My brother took off the shirt, and I kid you not, went into the backyard, poured gasoline on it, and <laughs> burned it. My nephew, I don't think, has been quite the same since. But, but that's... You understand where this book is coming from now. Anyway, Shankly signed and promoted Keegan when he arrived from Scunthorpe. And this is, this is what Shankly said to Keegan. Just go out and drop a few hand grenades all over the place, son. It's an apocryphal recounting of what Shank said to, to Keegs. And Keegan was like a hand grenade, exploding with pace in the penalty area. His quick, small, muscular frame and his knack for goals made him difficult to defend against. He quickly became King Kevin, King of the Cop, KK. Kevin Keegan was my first Liverpool FC hero. I walked a couple of miles from my working class township to a public library in a middle class suburb to borrow a copy of his autobiography. Strong as the keegan Shankly bond was, the striker also thrived perhaps more so under the quieter Bob Paisley, who hailed from the English northeast town of hetton la Hoe, County Durham, the son of a miner like Bill Shankly. Paisley played for, captained, and coached Liverpool before becoming, with great reluctance, manager in 1977. Succeeding Shanks seemed like an impossible task, but Bob Paisley proved everybody, perhaps himself included, wrong. In the history of English football, for my money, the most successful manager ever in the game, um, seven years, nine titles, two European championships. Take that, Arsene Wenger. Um, Paisley added to his number seven's capacity for endless activity, deft touches, and better footballing vision. For both these managers, Keegan was the consummate team player, gregarious with the media, but selfless in relation to the Liverpool cause. The Keeg was equally hardworking for a mediocre English side. He tracked back, he defended from the front, he gave everything in every game. He ran for his teammates, forming a wonderful partnership with his striking partner, the big Welshman John Toshak, and the winger Steve Highway. A graduate of Warwick University, Highway remains one of the most well-educated, formally speaking, professional players in England. 
Highway was, until the end of just two seasons ago, the coach of Liverpool's Youth Academy. Tosha, for his part, later went on to manage, among other clubs, Swansea City and Real Madrid. He's the current coach, with some success, I should say, of the Welsh national team. Toshak loved to win the ball in the air, which the graceful highway crossed with an uncanny accuracy, and Keegan thrived on running on to the Welshman's flicks and knock-ons. It was a little and large partnership worth watching, especially because the three of them brought out the best in each other. In retrospect, Keegan was clearly an English player ahead of his time. He loved Liverpool's success, but he wanted to test himself on the continent, as the English call Europe. Uh, unlike his compatriots, Keegan saw a world beyond Anfield, beyond England. Keegan was not characterized by the provinciality so common among Englishmen. When the great 1980s Liverpool forward Ian Rush went to Turin to play for Juventus, he was so awestruck by the cultural differences that he described Italy in one of the most famous footballing faux pas as a foreign country. And well, Rush is a really nice bloke. Um, in truth, um, Keegan is probably, you know, the, the Welshman John Charles of at Juventus accepted. Keegan may be the only English player to have succeeded in Europe. Don't believe anything they say about that fool who plays in L.A. Um, <laughs> that's more looks than good play, um, but that's just me. Bitterness will take you strange places. Um, before Keegan, Manchester United's Dennis Law failed, as did Rush almost a decade later, although players such as Graham Souness, Trevor Francis, and Luther Blissett recorded modest accomplishments in Italy. No, no other British footballer has matched Kevin Keegan's achievements. In the 1999-2000 season, ex-Liverpool winger Steve McManaman became the first Englishman to win a European Cup or Champions League medal with a non-English team, Real Madrid. McManaman went on to win two Champions League medals, but he never quite established himself in the Real team. McManaman, an expansive TV pundit these days, Channel 615 if you have it, is always attired in a fine suit. I have a certain respect for that. And he has the rare distinction of being a native Liverpudlian who grew up an Everton fan only to be signed by the Reds and a fate, I hate to say, shared by ex-skipper Robbie Fowler. Evertonian fandom is a deplorable condition from which both these fine players have thankfully recovered. Um, Keegan played his best football at Anfield, but he sought greater challenges after winning every trophy both England and Europe had to offer. He departed in 1977, May 25th, I think, after lifting the prestigious European Cup on that glorious Wednesday night in May in Rome. It was to be the first of five Liverpool European Cup triumphs, but none was more special than that one, especially because it came a scant four days after that galling FA Cup final defeat. My first encounter, as I explained, with Liverpool Live by Manchester United. Rome was Kevin Keegan's finest hour as he ran his German marker, Bertie Vogts, later the, later the manager of the German and Scottish national teams, and I think now in charge of Nigeria or something like that. Um, but the latter was spectacular failure. Keegan ran him ragged. On that night, KK own, earned his most endearing so sobriquet, the Scarlet Pompanel. Keegan was elusive, twisting and sprinting his way past German defenders as Liverpool ran out 3-1 winners. He made Liverpool fans the world over forget the FA Cup defeat. It was a parting gift, a memorable one to be sure, as he left that summer to join Hamburg Sportsverein in Germany. And there too he shone, winning, Euro winning European Player of the Year honours. I still follow European sports, I mean Hamburg SV's results today because of Keegan. The Keegs' wanderlust deepened against my Liverpool will, my knowledge of European football. He attached me to a, and this is how sick I am, a foreign club by sim simply by virtue of his presence. A schoolboy's loyalty can take on remarkable forms. It can, it can make you trace the path from Scunthorpe, England, to Hamburg, Germany, and locate yourself affectively in relation to both. Okay, I'm going to just read this thing about Sunez because I'll feel um, bad if I don't. Until John Barnes and Steven Gerrard came along, Graham Souness remained the object of my great passion. He was even for a while my favorite footballer of all time. I know this is a strange and even a boldly silly claim to make. Not many football fans would have chosen, perhaps nobody, would have chosen so relatively unknown a player as their all-time favorite when they could have picked from Brazil's Pele or Ronaldo or Ronaldinho 
Hungary's 1950 legend, Frank Puskas, um, Germany's Franz Beckenbauer, Argentina's, and for my money, the greatest player ever, Alfredo Di Stefano, and Maradona. The Netherlands is Johan Cruyff, or Ruud Gullet, a man who too makes his living these days in LA, or Eusebio of Portugal. In conventional terms, Sunes does not rank with the footballing greats. For many pundits, he's merely one of the great Scottish players of all time, along with Del Gleish, unquestionably the greatest of all Scots. A distinction that is noteworthy, but hardly laudable. Today I, wrote, I rate Barnes and Gerard above Suey, but he retains a special place in my Liverpool affections. A Scot like Del Gleish, Sunes came to the Reds unheralded via the chilly outposts of Middlesbrough, a city on the banks of the River Tee in the hard-bitten English Northeast. A retreaded left back who had failed to make the grade at Spurs as a player, Sunes was an archetypal self-made player. He taught himself, um, albeit, um, you know, when he was at Barrow, Jackie Charlton said to him, in that brusque way of his, you know, you either become a central midfielder or it's the unemployment line. Sunes chose the wise option. Um, at the most pivotal position in the game, Sunes learned how to control the pace of play, how to use his left back's ability to tackle, how to spray passes, how to change play from one side of the park to the other, how to hold the ball, and how to hit wicked long-range shots. Naturally left-footed, he developed his right, transforming it into a powerful shot. At the peak of his career, he favored neither. He tackled with menace, and his presence instilled fear in his opponents. Losing was not in his vocabulary. Anybody who plays for me should be a bad loser, Sunes remarked to those in his charge when he became manager. His first managerial job was with Glasgow Rangers as player manager, where it was a massive success. Then, after moving to Anfield to replace Del Gleish, he was rather less successful. Subsequent stints at Galatasaray, Istanbul, Turkey, um, Southampton, Blackburn, and U Newcastle yielded little compared with his Rangers days. Interestingly, both Sunes and Del Gleish managed Liverpool, Blackburn, and Newcastle, and them such different men. Sunes, beloved by all Scousers, Sui, more or less, universally despised. I feel for him, but as you'll see, there may be reasons not to. As regards his lifelong mantra about his distaste for defeat, Sunes set a fine example. I loved Graham Sunes because he did not so much captain Liverpool as command the team. Liverpool has never had a more committed and dare I say better captain. Only Gerard may displace him, and that is in part because the Scouser is surrounded by talent inferior to Sui's teammates. Neither would I venture has Scotland, whom he led after he ascended to the international ranks, neither has Scotland had a better skipper. Sunes played 54 times for Scotland, making his debut in 1975 and representing his country at three consecutive World Cups, 1978, 1982, and 1986. Leadership comes naturally to the hard man from Edinburgh, as was evidenced by the magnificent job he did of revitalizing Glasgow Rangers during his immensely successful tenure there. Sunes was mustachioed and impeccably dressed. He's a vain bastard. His, his, teammate, his Middlesbrough teammate, Phil Boosma, also ex-Liverpool, said affectionately of him. And so he was, quite the fashion plate, and the man about to, town too, if such rumors are about to be believed. Sunes was a powerful presence. Uh, I'll just tell you the story. I, uh, I was invited to give this talk, as I said, and so I stayed at this really crappy Victorian hotel. And I came in and they noticed my accent and somebody said, so governor, who do you support? And I'm like, don't ask me stupid questions. Um, and, and you know, so I go on and I give this whole spiel about Sunes and Barnes and Gerard. And this guy said, yeah, yeah, Sunes, he used to come here all the time. He'd drink at the bar until 3 in the morning and then get up for practice and look like he didn't have a shot at all. But he was, the stories about Sunes are always about him being alone. And there's something remarkably tragic. I'll just tell you this. It's 1993, and I, had, um, I was about to get out of grad school, and I had this money um, that I could use you know, to go abroad, and I went to Liverpool. I made up a reason to go there. It's entirely corrupt, but I was like... And um, 
I promised I did some work in the British Museum, but none of it <laughs> counted. Um, and I went, it was like a Sunday afternoon. I'd never been to Liverpool before. And it's a truly depressing place. The wind was whooping off the mercy. There was no sunshine. It was the middle of July. And the man, you know, like the stadium, it's in this working class neighborhood, surrounded by barbed wire and, and these, it's like the local stadiums in Cape Town when I was playing. They had cement with bottles, broken bottles sticking up. That's how poor the neighborhood is around Anfield. And there's this one door that's slightly ajar, and it's the groundsman's gate, and I knock, and I knock, and this guy speaks an impenetrable language, and I <laughs> say I'm a Liverpool fan, and I can tell him everything about the club. This guy's like, you're crazy, right? And I say, at this moment, I'm still in love with Sunez. Um, so I say, like, I tell him all the stuff, about, and he says, the governor's in the office. He says, like, you want to go? I look at him, and he's like, why are you hesitating? A second time, and I'm, a third time, and I say, Say, okay, and he says, there. I walk, and Suness is left handed and left with me. And there's a door, the jar, maybe seven centimeters or something. And I can see Suness. <laughs> and the guy urges me, he says, go, go. And I can't bring myself <laughs> to do it. And he says, I, I look, turn and I shake my head and I walk away. And he says, why? And I swear to God, and I'm quoting myself, I said, I'm not ready to meet God. <laughs> I was. Totally overwhelmed, and I'm really overwhelmed. Um, but it was this meeting of seeing this man intensely focused. This was it, and I'd never met anybody like that. I'd seen footballers who are committed. I'd met academics who'd given their lives this, but I'd never seen a man so solely focused and so entirely composed and living in his own self. Um, I understand his loneliness, and it was kind of this poetic, instructive moment that I thought of was, was kind of funny, but was deeply, deeply disturbing and tragic in the same gesture. So um, I have a very complicated relationship to Suness. But anyway, this is not the kind of stuff you should expose in public because <laughs> it's the kind of stuff can get you, you know, people can use against you. Yeah, help is a word for it. But um, anyway, um, anyway, he moved quickly with an unmistakable deliberateness. Graham Suness never walked on the pitch. He strode with authority, without fear, always with supreme confidence. Soon as a single-mindedness, his passionate commitment to victory would emerge most clearly in his days as the manager of Glasgow Rangers after he returned from Italy. However, the steely resolve and singleness of purpose were never as abundantly clear as in his playing days. I loved watching Sui boss a park. That means you're in charge when you say you boss the park. Um, commanding the field like a martinet through sheer force of will. I remember how opponents used to cower at the sight of him. Manchester United's midfielder, Brian Robson, a renowned alcoholic, but I'm, a uni I'm against United. And this is true. Ask people. He's totally a drunk. Um, um, anyway, Manchester United's midfielder, Brian Robson, one clearly sensed, was more or less petrified at the prospect of a Suness tackle. I loved Robson's fear. Suness is an intense man without, it is said, many friends in the game. He was so committed to his job that he coached Liverpool to their 1992 FA Cup victory just three weeks after a triple bypass operation. He looked a little pale on the sidelines, that famous moustache droop, drooping just a little. But there he was, Sui in charge, putting victory before his very life. Graham Suness has definite views about football and the world, some of which I later learned I admired and others I strongly disagreed with. Coming to Glasgow Rangers as a player manager, he was intent on ending the club's anti-Catholic policy. He did this by signing the ex-Celtic forward, uh, Maurice Johnson, Mojo, who's now coaching, if memory serves, up in Toronto. Um, but Mojo was the first um, Catholic to play for, knowingly play for Glasgow Rangers. There had been others before, but people didn't know that they were Catholic. So, when, um, on the 10th of July, 1989, the day Suness signed the Catholic striker dubbed Mojo marks a historic moment in Scottish, not only Glaswegian history. This was an ideologically courageous decision, perhaps unmatched in Scotland's cultural history. It was such a momentous event that it prompted Sui's biographer, Sandy Jameson, to proclaim him the Scotsman of the century. Suness also signed the first black player for Rangers, 
the Aston Villa winger Mark Walters. He would later sign Walters for Liverpool too. So although Jameson's evaluation may be a tad hubristic, it must be acknowledged that Sunessa's political bravery, his courage and his resolve changed not only the Rangers, changed not only Rangers, but the ethnically and racially riven and religiously divided face of Glasgow football forever. However ideologically admirable in one respect, Sunes revealed a deeply conservative bent in another phase of his public life. Unlike most footballers who have working class roots and are thus largely reticent about their, their support for the conservatives, Sunes was middle class and willing to proclaim himself a supporter of the Tory leader, Maggie Thatcher, a woman widely despised by the Scottish working classes and their Liverpool cousins, and a significant portion, I should add, of the middle classes as well. Su Sunes was ever the maverick, but this time he was even more isolated than usual because of the devastation um, Thatcher's free market policies visited on the British working classes. Because of his allegiance to Thatcher, his biographer Jameson dubs Sunes the Iron Lady's Man. It was a slightly ironic nickname, I think. Sunes certainly had a reputation as a ladies' man. Champagne Charlie, they used to call him in his Liverpool days. And Maggie was hardly his type aesthetically. Not quite good looking enough, I'd venture. But they were a match made in their approach. Um, hers to politics, he's to football. Tough in combat, sometimes dirty. While even Sunessa's detractors grudgingly acknowledged his achievements in breaking down the anti Catholic bias of Rangers, his affiliation with the Tory leaders and her, ideo and her ideology seriously damaged his relationship with the very anti-Tory working classes who had exalted him as a player on the terraces in Liverpool and Glasgow. Sunessa's greatest ideological transgression in his tenure as Liverpool manager, however, was committed when he agreed to tell the, tell the story of his heart problems to The Sun, a Rupert Murdoch-owned newspaper. The Sun was boycotted by Liverpudlians of the Blue, which is the Everton, and the Red Variety after its disgraceful coverage of the... Um, April 1989, 1989, Hillsborough disaster. Um, Liverpool, Liverpool was playing Nottingham Forest at Hillsborough uh, at the Lemmings, Lemmings Road end. Um, the Liverpool fans were trapped. The stand collapsed. Liverpool fans couldn't get out. Um, 96 of them died, including young Paul Galuli, who was Steven Gerrard's cousin. And Gerrard himself was, had a ticket for that game. So Gerrard opens his biography talking about his cousin. And he says every day he drives into Anfield he sees this thing and, you know, he touches his cousin's name. So it's a very strange, I mean, Liverpool's a kind of city that invites tragedy. Um, anyway, so Sunes then decides to sell his, um, his story um, to the Sun, and the Sun had blamed the Scousers for the tragedy when the real issue with the police's crowd control, the dangerous wire that would not let fans escape from the collapsing Lemmings Road end of the Hillsborough Stadium and the terrace seating, seating that crammed thousands into an unsafe facility. Even today, as I found out while walking through Liverpool in 2005 and 6, almost 20 years after Hillsborough, there are posters up around Anfield urging Liverpudlians to boycott the sun. Sunes apologized for his mistake, but by then the damage was done. The goodwill he had accrued in the aftermath of his illness dissipated rapidly. What the sun incident revealed as much as anything was both Sunes's commitment to following his own path and, more importantly, how removed he was from the Coppites, how much he was not of the people whose lives are defined by their relationship to Liverpool Football Club. Ideological disloyalty does not sit well with the Anfield faithful. I admired Sui, and I know how much I modeled, with no evident success, my game on his. But after the son's revelation, I knew my relationship with him would be forever changed. What he had done was too close, even for a Sui partisan like me, to betrayal. I forgave, but forgetting was impossible. Still, I watched him with a sympathetic eye whenever Liverpool played against him, and he was at Southampton, at Blackburn, at Newcastle. I can take no pleasure in his failures, and when he got fired, I felt for him, though I felt that as he got older, his fashion sense degenerated somewhat. <laughs> that disappointed me as much as anything. It was too important to me as a Liverpool icon to, lose, to either lose so often leading such mediocre teams, or to dress so indifferently. I had played too many games inspired by his example, had modeled myself too closely on him. My teammates on my local side in Cape Town, 
Um, they honored me by dubbing me with just a hint of gentle Rubin Suness. Um, so for all that, I cannot but have a felicitous relationship with Graham Suness. He is, by all accounts, not exactly likable, but he has never made excuses for himself. On my office door when I was teaching at Duke, um, there, is a, there used to be this picture of Suness getting married in Las Vegas, I think. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, don't, <laughs> please. Um, there, is no, there is no one else in the picture except Graham and his new bride. In, it is, in truth, a rather sad picture, as wedding photographs go. His new wife is beautifully coiffed, egg white, knee-length dress, topped with a grand matching hat, standing next to Graham. For his part, Suey is a study in sartorial splendor, wheat-colored suit, tie-knotted, just so, and seriousness. His face suggests that he's occupied with weighty matters, more weighty matters than a very newly married man should properly have. <laughs> but then, even in the midst of matrimonial bliss, Graham Suness has always been a man apart. He made, new friend, made few friends in the game and out of it. He has always been fiercely proud of his ability to keep his own counsel, to hold the world at arm's length, and still inspire his teams to victory. Appropriately, Suness evoked ambivalence from me admiration for the footballer, respect for his leadership and his cultural and ideological courage, yet I was sometimes at odds with his political conservatism and his ideological insensitivity, for want of a better term. Nevertheless, there are moments, pure football moments, I recall with unadulterated pleasure. Sui in command, Sui dictating from the center of the park, Sui spraying that inch-perfect pass, Sui making a bone-crunching tackle so crunching you can hear it in the next county. Suey always barking at his teammates. Suey always above all else, refusing to lose, refusing to as much as contemplate defeat. Thank you. enough hatred in me for both of them. <laughs> we play Everton on Saturday, I mean on Sunday, so yeah, I'm still, I'm still really ticked at Steve Bennett, so, and Pepe Reina. I hate goalkeepers and referees. As a coach, I don't know how you feel, Brian, but goalkeepers are not to be trusted. They are mad, unthinking people. <laughs> referees, however, should be lined up and shot, not once, but many, many times. Steve Bennett first amongst them. Everton I have a kind of sympathy for because they just lose us. They're a small team. When they beat us, then I kind of get miffed. But Man United, that's like corporate megalomania. They're utterly despicable. Um, nothing bad enough can ever happen to them. So I hate them all, but if I, my life depended upon it, I could, I could kind of give the Toffees a pass. But Man United never. The scum of God's earth. <laughs> I don't know how you sell but you're, you're insane if you buy one. <laughs> I want to know, how do you write a book like this and publish it? I mean, how do you find a press that's willing to put it, I mean, uh, granted you write it in, in perfectly poetic prose, but um, a, a press that is willing to take a risk on taking something that we think of as a cultural object seriously. Wow. You know, I think I should refer to Professor McLean. He probably has a much better answer than I do. I don't know how you do that, but let me sort of tell a story. Um, I, was, I, gave this, I was part of this round table at a conference about a week ago, last Thursday, on sovereignty. And I was talking to this guy, and we were like going at it. And I was quoting Carl Schmidt and Derrida and, you know, and, and telling him why I thought Ranciere's argument on democracy is more valuable than Bardieu's and so on. And the guy hadn't caught my name. And then at the end, he said to me, so you're? It's like, I know you work in football. Yeah. So there was this, and it was a kind of moment that took me back. Because I think the expectation is academics don't write books like this. Right. So I can't tell you how, but I can also tell you that this book is probably the one I've had in me the longest. 
you know, it's probably a book I was born with. Maybe. I mean, I can remember February 1970, and this is how I became a Liverpool fan. It's a completely arbitrary moment. Um, I don't know what it's like in, it's not like this in the U.S. Anybody grew up outside of the U.S. here? Yeah. Okay, so you know what that weird thing is, right? There are two papers. Where did you grow up? Sorry? Oh, well, that's not really. That's just, they're the nice Americans. <laughs> but um, in, in the colonies, you have two papers, in the morning and in the afternoon. And because my father worked, I, my responsibility was to get the paper. You get the paper in the morning, and I'd wait for him to come home. We'd more or less trade papers. He was like, you should read the front page. I was like, hell no. <laughs> yeah, I thought he, I'm sure he thought I was just going to be an utter waste. Um, but, you know, and I'd probably have ended up, but, you know, at least a Liverpool waste. Um, and so I, I fetched the newspaper, and it was the third or fourth Monday in February 1970. And I jumped over the fence at home because it was quicker than running. And I opened the newspaper, and it said Liverpool were in second place. That was it. It's the only reason I became a Liverpool fan. And, and later on, I would discover it was kind of a Catholic club. I, this is one, I have this wonderful sweatshirt that a friend of mine bought, and it says... Um, Train the right way, treat each other right. Football, it's socialism without the politics. Somebody gave that to me. Um, in fact, an American um, writer called Joe McGuinness wrote this really cool book called, you know, on, on Santiago de Compostela. Joe and I would watch Liverpool games together. Um, and he became a football fan like in his 50s. But I, I can't tell you how to write the book. I can't tell you how to get a publisher interested. I can just tell you that if your pathology is public enough, somebody might want to take a risk. But I would say you want to think about that. <laughs> Do you think Arsenal is going to put six past Liverpool twice again this year? Somebody get that man out of here. <laughs> it's kind of annoying. Like. <laughs> Um, two draws and we win the game at Anfield. Because we can play in Europe, nobody else can. Europe is in our genes. We can win the Premier League, we can play in Europe. We draw the two games at the Emirates, we win at Anfield. In a sense, coming back to corporate megalomania, but I'm interested when you talk about the fans' proprietary investment in the club. Are there any owners, and you know what I'm thinking of, who could do enough to actually disrupt that relationship? That, or, or does somehow the club outlast Hicks and Gillette and whoever else thinks of it as maybe a quick win business proposition? I don't know. But I threatened to bankrupt us, my wife and I, just like about a month ago because there was this talk that there'd be 4,000 fans and you needed $10,000. And I was like, hey, we can sell the house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the cars and the kids if we want to <laughs> see what they'll fetch. You know, like as... Anybody ever watch Everybody Loves Raymond? And he's talking about investments. He's like, the kids, you know, when are we going to see a dime on that investment? Um, so you can see I spend my life watching bad TV and football. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I worry about that. I really do because has anybody been to Liverpool? Yeah, so you know what it's like. It's a depressing as hell city. I mean, up, have you been to Anfield? I mean, you've been to Melwood, right? Melwood is great now. And Anfield, but you know, like just around Anfield, houses that are boarded up, it's a poor, poor community. And, you know, the first, every time I go there, I think I'm going to sort of get over it, and I never do. Um, and Barnes has taken me in, because, like, we're boys now, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, I mean, I didn't read the part about Barnes because I figured that's just too much. But, um, he calls me up and he gets me games. And my daughter's going to be in England next year studying abroad. And one of the Bonds is like, I'll get you. Take I mean, my book is dedicated to John Bonds in the same terms, you know, to God and God's own son, for Stephen Gerrard. I mean, but Bonds took me into Anfield the first time. And I looked around and I came out. And I, I couldn't deal with it because there's just this utter sense of physical degradation. It's an incredibly poor city. On my first visit there, as I described, I saw three people dividing a Big Mac equally. Um, and I look at that, and these corporate types who are, you know, I sat in the Paisley stand. I mean, the, yeah, Paisley stand. I paid $100 for a ticket. 
you know, bonds. It's like, no, 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 I'll pay for your ticket. I mean, we took him out to dinner, and this guy's like walking around with wads of cash. It's like a drug dealer from Jamaica, you know? But anyway, I shouldn't say, I, I adore Bonzi. Um, but it's a, I, I don't know, and I, that question troubles me a great deal, because the thought of my club passing on to something else, or passing into the hands of people who don't understand it, and in some ways, that's what the book is about. It's about this deep unending, you know, my daughter or Liverpool, okay, my daughter, damn. <laughs> um, but that kind of relationship, it's in some ways more extreme than what people there feel, because if you ask somebody at, who was a Liverpudlian, Everton or Liverpool, they're just like, we hate man, you, they wouldn't even think about it, it wouldn't be a question for them. For me, the fact that Everton, any club that like pitches up to play against us, I'm offended, you know? The fact that they put 11 players on the other side of the park, how dare they, you know? That's kind of where I am, but for those people, it is their club, and you see increasingly fewer and fewer people from the community. But one of the, if you have an opportunity and you, you can go to a game at Anfield, arrive at around 3.15, settle down, get yourself bad tea and sausage roll, and look at the Anfield Road end. It is utterly, utterly amazing. At precisely 3.25, the entire um, cop end, Named after, a, um, named after a battalion called Spionkop, who um, was pretty much you know, left out to dry uh, in the Anglo-Boer War in, I think, 1901. So they called Spionkop, all these reasons why I can claim to be a Liverpool fan that was historically you know, fated or something like that, but not true. But, so the cop, the most famous fans in the world, they sing beautifully, they're really clever. Um, Robbie Fowler, who's from Liverpool 8, um, he owns, he's the wealthiest player in the Premier League. It's not Beckham. So the fans sing, and I'm going to do this imitation, but it's really, really bad, so I shouldn't even sing in the shower. Um, but they sing like, We all live in a Robbie Fowler house. A Robbie Fowler house. These people are making fun of the fact that they don't have houses to go to. Or they'll sing like, you know, to the same tune of that Beatles thing, right? Um, we all dream of a team of characters. And I'm like, Jamie sucks. But... Anyway, I mean, that's, it's just this amazing experience. But at 325, you see these people. They come up, and the Liverpool flag, they, go, they march right up there. And there it is, LFC forever, something. And you're just like, my God. And then they sing, you know, you'll never walk alone. You have not lived until you have heard that anthem sung. And I kid you not, I have no affect, but <laughs> when they sing that, I'm like, shit, I could cry here, you know? It's a truly remarkable, and that, the sort of losing that, going to a new stadium, a corporate name stadium. Nothing could destroy my love for Liverpool, but that could certainly tarnish it. And I, this is the moment I know I'm anachronistic, I'm out of step with the times. And I spoke to Barnes about this, and he's like, look, when we were winning titles in the 80s, we should have cashed in. And I'm like, no, thank God we're not Man United, right? I mean, have you been to Old Trafford? It's at the end of, it's completely removed from the city, right? I mean, it's a really nice stadium, and there's a great museum, a war museum. You go out there, but it's like, it's just completely dislocated. Have you ever been to, anybody been to Main Road? It smells like a urinal, right? It, I went to the dressing rooms, because they let anybody go in there. They're like, hey, we'll take you, you know? Want to play for us? Yeah. Um, Gretna? Yeah, kidding, I'm kidding. Um, but... It smells like a urinal, but it was totally located in the city. Now, City of Manchester, um, city of Manchester Stadium, all these new stadiums, they just feel like, how do you like throw down Highbury? You know, those wonderful, that wonderful narrow park. I am nostalgic, I suppose, for a day when, you know, for those days when you felt like this was genuinely a community. I'm not against, you know, other people watching the game or great players, I just feel there has to be some kind of umbilical or toxinous relationship between place and club. And, you know, this is the difference between Liverpool Football Club, and I also support, as Chris, um, what's his name, Boomer, whatchamacallit, um, would have it like, um, uh, you know, the New York football giants, right? I mean, hey, I still can't believe that. I'm still pretty high on Eli, right? That, that'll, that'll wear off in a heartbeat. Um, but New York, I mean, American sports institutions are franchises. English institutions are clubs. They're owned by the community, if not you know, financially, 
is a real affective relationship between place and institution. And Hicks doesn't get it. Gillette doesn't get it. You know, they don't even know the proper names of the team. You know, unless you can tell me who Ray Clements is, can't pass the test. And I'm, I'm not being facetious. Unless you know what Keegan means, or Dalgleish means, or Barnes means, or, or Gary Gillespie, God knows, means, or, or you know, um, or, or Jan Malby, who was so fat he could balance a ball on his tummy, right? And yet was Danish eloquence itself. I mean, I, I want that kind of investment in the people who own the club. And I don't mean they'll make the right decision, but I'm less interested in winning, though I I'm Sunesian in that way. But what's much more important to me is that there's some kind of honor and integrity in the tradition of my club. So if, that, if that's everything, then everybody's welcome to help themselves with some life water and some cupcakes up here with footballs at the top. <laughs> <laughs> and again, thanks very much to Professor Carroll. <laughs>